the global logistics consultant, uh, formerly head of global logistics for Bechtel. He will be moderating this discussion and he has gathered um, executives from a variety of sectors. So we'll get to hear different perspectives on these um, issues. So I did want, before I turn it over to Dennis, I just want to quickly draw your attention to the right-hand panel on your screen. You'll see um, one of the tabs says Q&A. So this is the, our entire program today will be Q&A. So I encourage you to type in your questions there and uh, Dennis will feed those to our guests. So without um, any more chatting, I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to uh, everyone, uh, contingent upon where you might be calling in or tuning in from. So, uh, Leslie, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to, to uh, lead this panel. We've got a great group of uh, uh, folks here uh, that have uh, agreed to uh, to join us. So, um, before we get started, um, I, I wanted just to uh, raise for everyone's attention an issue in our industry right now, and then we'll, we'll get into introductions and then promptly get into the to the subject matter. But um, we have an issue that uh, is a humanitarian issue that I think we all need to uh, to tune into and to uh, influence behavior to the extent that we can. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, publicity around CFARs that are stranded at sea uh, due to the coronavirus. So uh, it's estimated that there are some 200,000 CFARs that can't get off the ship that they're on and have uh, in some cases been on that ship for up to 15 months. And uh, an equal number of uh, CFARs that are at home that can't get back to work uh, due to uh, restrictions uh, or immigration issues, border issues around the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, there are there's a lot of information that's out there. Uh, if you just Google uh, UN News, there's a there's an article. My children ask me when I'm coming home. Is an article. Uh, Splash274.com has an article on it, and then the the BBC has a podcast on it. So. Uh, I'd ask everyone uh, as a humanitarian gesture just to tune yourself into this, do what you can to uh, influence behaviors. Uh, perhaps even you want to make uh, um, asking the question of your carrier, what are they doing about this issue? Maybe even as a vetting uh, criteria, who knows? So uh, I'll leave it at that. But if, uh, if anybody has uh, a question about that, wants more further information, please do uh, uh, come to me and I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the benefit of the information I have on it. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, just go around the panel here, ask the panel to uh, uh, introduce themselves. We'll go in the order of Ken, Pascal, Brian, and then uh, Leonard. So uh, Ken, if you can lead us off, please. Brief introduction. Thank you, Dennis. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, of course, when uh, Mr. Matol asked you if you want to be part of a panel, you you of course uh, say yes and uh, thank you. Uh, so Dennis, thank you for having me be part of it. When he then proceeded to say that he has uh, no say in, within the Bechtel group, I was like, well, Dennis now in too deep, so we gotta we gotta keep going. But thank you, Dennis, for having me, and uh, thank you for putting this up. Um, anyway, uh, uh, some of you uh, have read the introduction, I'm sure. Um, I own and run a company called TSL Shipping and Trading, and uh, we are. Um, owner reps in America for a few carriers, um, and I've worked uh, for many years with uh, a few European carriers, so mostly on the carrier side, and um, have of course been part of the vetting process on uh, as from a carrier perspective, but also trying to assist some of our clients in, from a shipper perspective. So I'll try and give you some insight on that. Dennis has prepared a nice list of questions for all of us, so let's see what we get through. Thank you, Ken. Pascal. All right. Um, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, my, so my name is Pascal Lecrae. Um, I'm the uh, director for logistics in Halliburton. Um, so I uh, worked in the oil and gas industry for 12 years. And before that, I, I spent a couple of years in aviation. Um, moved around the world a little bit, I think, uh, as the oil and gas does to you. Um, and I'm, I'm in Houston right now um, for the last five years. And so 
I think the uh, the vetting process of, of of carriers and logistics providers is something that I think we need, we are very careful with. So interesting discussion for for today's panel. But um, glad to be part of uh, part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Vitalis. I'm with General Electric. I work within our global operations group, supporting our uh, marine uh, uh, operations globally from procurement to execution, mostly focused on our uh, break bulk out of gauge, the big and ugly. You know, in, in today's market for GE, what keeps us the most busy is our renewables side of the business. Um, and in my role, though, we support any business that uh, needs our assistance from gas to transportation to renewables. Uh, I'm excited to be here this morning. Thank you, Brian. Leonard. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on the program this morning. Really appreciate the invite. Uh, of course, my name is Leonard Hedrick and I'm with Belor Logistics, been in the logistics and supply chain industry for the last 24 years. I've spent the last four years with Belor Logistics as the Director of Industrial Projects, uh, focused on business development activities with uh, major global EPC accounts. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Leonard, for, uh, for joining us. So uh, with that, let's get started. Just for the record, though, I did not threaten Ken to, say, uh, to join this. He did it on his own uh, volition, so he, there was no pressure, but uh, really glad to have him uh, and the rest of the panelists uh, joining us today. It's a fresh group of faces, and uh, we're really, really honored to have them with us. So the, uh, the subject we're going to talk about today is uh, vetting logistics service providers. And uh, whether we are shippers uh, or we are service providers, intermediaries that are buying services on behalf of others uh, or subcontracting uh, part of what we do to others, um, we all want to get to a place where we are, we have complete confidence in the uh, service providers that we've selected and uh, or at least knowing that we've done everything that we can do uh, to make the right decision about the uh, the partners that we're going to uh, to give a piece of our responsibility to. Uh, and uh, after all, uh, we're ultimately responsible for those decisions to uh, to our company uh, and to our customers. And in a lot of cases, uh, our credibility in the company, our reputation is uh, is on the line every time we make those uh, one of those critical decisions about who we're going to uh, invite to, to help us get our jobs done. So uh, today what we want to discuss is the uh, kind of the first steps of that process uh, in vetting logistics service providers. And uh, these are the folks that are out there uh, that are you know, pursuing an opportunity to do business with us, but also at the same time, they are vetting uh, the folks that are buying services because ultimately, uh, uh, they too are concerned with, uh, particularly in the, the COVID-19 world, who they're doing business with and uh, the confidence that they need to have about the, uh, the folks that they're going to be taking on as, uh, as customers. So uh, I'll be asking the questions and uh, our panelists will be uh, providing answers. They've all seen the questions ahead of time, so they have, they've had the opportunity to prepare uh, however, uh, as Leslie said, if we, uh, uh, if we see questions come in during the course of the, uh, uh, the webinar that look, uh, really interesting, uh, we'll, we'll grab one of those and just, uh, throw it at one of the panelists and, uh, ask them to take the best shot at trying to answer that. So, uh, with that, uh, the way I'd like to get started today is if, uh, our two shippers on the panel, Pascal and Brian could uh, talk a little bit about uh, their process, uh, their program for uh, vetting logistic service providers and why that's such an important uh, item uh, in, in their mind. And then uh, on top of that, why it's important in, uh, in this COVID-19 world that we're, we're living through. So Pascal, if you could get us started, that would be, uh, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think COVID-19, I think, uh, mainly been, been a reminder how much, uh, how critical the logistics providers are that we have in, have in our network, right? And so we rely very heavily, um, on these logistics providers to move our cargo, keep us informed of what they see, 
uh, on the ground, right? Uh, and situations like this, this have just been stressing that again um, on how, how important that is. So I think the, uh, the two main criteria for us, I think the, the compliance piece is, is obviously uh, uh, one thing that, that uh, pushes pretty heavily on this process. Uh, but just having the financial stability and understanding the structure um, of each of these logistics providers and, and, uh, and service providers, right, uh, I think is, is a critical part of uh, why we're doing the vetting um, and why we're going in depth uh, on this, right? And so we're, we're trying to make sure that they're matching kind of the needs that we have as an organization um, and that they, they have the stability that we're requiring to move our business, right? So. I think that's that's um, the criteria why it's that that important for us. Um, our process itself, without going into much detail, um, is very centralized. Um, we're we're joined up with our legal team on this and some external partners on on going through that vetting of, of those providers. But uh, fairly extensive in the way. Uh, it might sound a little extensive sometimes for new providers, um, but uh, uh, I mean this is all part of the how important that is for us um, to, to look into the details. So, yeah, I think that is in, in, in kind of in short of, of how that works for us. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Or uh, thank you, Pascal. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about your your process? Sure, for us, generally, uh, you know, I've got a list of maybe 35 or 40, what, what we have as primary core carriers today that could range from 3PL freight folders that I use on the product side to asset-based carriers. Uh, those guys are carriers that have already been vetted. They're in our system, uh, and they run the gamut from could be liner row row carriers uh, to uh, uh, you know tramp vessel operators, heavy lift operators, to the to, to barges to special operators. And generally, for us, the demand will come from a business. The, the business might have, you know, uh, if we're talking to the team uh, for Europe onshore, you know, they might be sourcing a lot of product out of uh, Spain or, or, or Germany, and they really need an intra-Europe niche vessel operator. So we'll review the carriers there to see do we have the carrier in the mix to support that business. Or, you know, if we're doing inner Asia, for example, do we have the right carrier in the mix there? You know, usually we're really good on our, uh, our big east-west trades. Uh, you know, we've got great relationships, and we've got a number of carriers that can support those major trade lanes. And then a lot of times we'll get into a niche area where we maybe it's not a, a major carrier's fit, and we really need more of a, a niche player. And then we'll we'll dive into uh, try and identify carriers that can fit that specific niche for that business. And then we do a lot of that too, forward looking as well as uh, as units get bigger, as we grow the, the, you know, the, the wind turbine portfolio, we get challenges in that the components and things go to get bigger. And so the, 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 the mousetrap we're using today to move these, these goods around may not be what will work tomorrow. So we're constantly looking at forward, uh, do we have the right carriers in two years from now? Uh, and generally for us, once we identify a need, if we can find a carrier that fits it, it's going to provide valid, valid to the business, support it. You know, we'll bring them in, run them through the financial backgrounds, uh, have them agree to our standard MSA that uh, they agree to uphill holding certain uh, EHS standards as well as providing their subcontractors meet those standards and then we'll monitor and, and add them in the mix and that's but usually for us the drivers do we need a new care uh, vendor you know comes from the business level right do we have the right carriers in the mix there okay thank you Brian so uh, let yeah, us can, uh, I ask, can I ask something to Brian for that extent oh absolutely then Brian, um, just a, just a side note: How does uh, GE go out and um, introduce new carriers, uh, especially local carriers, into their system? And I bet there are some challenges vetting some of these local carriers and smaller. You know, if we let's say we identify an area where we don't. Go ahead. Hmm. Um, you know, generally, you, you know, to to, to where. Um, where 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 we're getting at, um, you know, if I if we identify a hole in the business, like we, we look like we just don't have the right cost position because we don't have the right carriers, you know, we'll I'll go out and I'll try and identify who those carriers are via through through various networking, through break bowl conferences, through, through research for for talking to agents, through do everything from you know you put up a pull up a port of call and see what carriers have been into that port over the last three months and try and identify someone. Then depending on that carrier depends on the strategy. If it's a really small niche carrier, like, a, you know, if we look at inner Asia, I mean, inner Europe, where a lot of that could be mom and pop type setups, uh, they may not want to do business with GE. They may not want to agree to our pay terms. They may not want to agree to our standards. In that case, we may look to partner with um, 
say a, a broker or 3PL, someone in that area that can bring that niche to us. And, and in our eyes, then we would view that person as the carrier and they have to ensure that whoever they subcontract to in that area abides in that. So it's a little bit of a, a legwork on my part. And then usually if we identify that smaller carrier, even though we might not uh, um, bring them on directly as a, as a vendor, because it might not be fair to them if we just need them for this one project that they go through all the hoops and we do business with them and we don't come back in five years, um, we though might sign like an MBA with them so that I can have a transparent and open conversation with them. Although at the end of the day, we might end up moving the cargo through one of our 3PLs or forwarders. And sometimes it's our 3PLs and forwarders that bring us that. You know, hey, Brian, we can fill this niche for you here. We've got a partner in that region that can do it. And then we work through them. I like that, Brian. We'll go through the You know, and I would say for, for the forwarders and 3 I would say for the folders and 3PLs for them, that's where they bring us the most value. Um, we don't need a you know a 3PL uh, you know calling BBC uh, on a trade line because we, we can do that ourselves. Well, we find the most value of those are your smaller niche trade lines where our major core carriers maybe don't have the right vessel or the right fit, and and so we would typically rely on those those uh, uh, vendors to bring that to us. Thank you, Brian. We we just happen to have a forwarder on our panel, and uh, the letter. <laughs> Uh, if you want to, uh, to get started, uh, one of the, I think, common questions that we hear is, uh, from folks that, that are trying to do better at, uh, vetting, uh, in making the right decision is what are, what are the most common things that, that, uh, uh, forwarders see as a, as a, the party receiving, uh, on the, on the vetted being the vetted party, what do you see as the most common uh, questions uh, or criteria that that shippers you use to uh, to vet their uh, forwarder logistics service providers. Thank you, Dennis. Um, typically, what we're seeing, obviously, they want to know about ownership. I mean, the bottom line is who who am I doing business with, or who we who are we going to be doing business with? So, are there any are there any partners? Is the company one hundred percent wholly owned? Uh, are you a private or a public company? Uh, are, there, are there elements that are included, of course, or global coverage, uh, your network? You know, can you handle my business door to door? Are you using agents? Uh, where, is, where is your network? Where are your offices? Uh, project experience is usually included. You know, what projects have you executed? When, where, what were the, what were the volumes? Uh, often we are asked to provide what are the largest pieces that we handled on a project. Uh, other elements are your systems cap capabilities, so your track and trace, uh, your inventory management systems, your forwarding systems. Uh, and then, of course, as we had touched on earlier, your financial records. Uh, what is your you know, financial stability? That's very important to the shippers. Uh, what percentage of your business is generated from projects, oil and gas, or other sectors? Uh, and then, of course, uh, ethics, ethics and compliance is, is always on there. You know, so what are the, what are the risks? Are there any concerns? Uh, and then your insurance and your liability limits. Uh, what type of coverages do you have in the, in the event of any accidents or incidents? So those, I would say, are some of the top ones that we normally see uh, on on the questionnaires when we're being vetted by, you know, shippers. Yeah. So uh, Pascal brought up uh, compliance and financial stability and structure uh, in his comments. Um, putting uh, COVID-19 aside, Leonard, um, uh, let's say over the last two or three years, have you seen um, uh, a, a heavier influence on any one particular uh, area that you uh, that you covered, be that compliance or insurance liability systems, uh, your network. Have you seen a, a trend maybe in the last couple of years where uh, that's gone in one direction and uh, shippers are putting more of an emphasis on that, even sustainability uh, issues as a uh, as a criteria for for uh, for vetting. Have you have you seen any change in the last couple of years? Yeah, definitely, Dennis. I mean, definitely more emphasis is being put on your uh, ethics and compliance program and also sustainability. Those are important issues today. 
Uh, you know, shippers want to know, you know, what is the amount of risk that is associated with doing business with a company today? And everyone is very, uh, you know, everyone is very conscious of, uh, of those types of risks. So uh, I would say that those are two, uh, definitely two elements, your CSR program and your ethics and compliance that are much more prominent than they were some years ago. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Um, so the, the, you know, the vetting process works uh, both ways, uh, whereby uh, uh, shippers and buyers of logistic services are uh, doing the best they can to, uh, to vet their service providers. Um, Ken, um, what's your approach with regard to vetting uh, the customers that you uh, are receiving inquiries from? And, uh, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, uh, you would want to make sure that you're, you're uh, sourcing a client that's going to be around, uh, one, to pay you, uh, but in the meantime, also that, that, that they produce the, the cargo and the, you know, the covenants that they enter into as part of an agreement that, uh, that they're going to live up to those uh, covenants and do what they say they're going to do. So kind of the same thing that shippers are trying to assess whenever they do vetting of um, you know, who am I doing business with? I think as, uh, uh, as Leonard mentioned, uh, uh, knowing that party that you're entering into a, uh, a partnership with. So Ken, can you throw a couple comments on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's very antiquated still, uh, Dennis, in that sense that, um, there is still, a, an old process of who have you done business with before? And, uh, can you give us a reference of your last three, um, cargoes that you've carried, for example, or uh, what other uh, logistics service providers have you been using, and can we get a reference from them? That's that's still very much the universal uh, case of doing business with shippers. And, and of course, the, the, the pressure the industry has been under uh, during the past even 15 years now, you know, it's, it's a case where revenue is king, and once you get the revenue on board the ship, you have a lot more security. Um, but um, there's no universal standard or no universal vetting that I know of of shippers at this point. Um, of course, there is a um, KYC process that has appeared over the last couple of years, and uh, that KYC process is more so to make sure that you're here to banking standards, money laundry standards, uh, than it is to actually vet the carrier or to vet the shipper. So. Um, that's definitely something that I foresee more carriers and with the consolidation that's been happening in the industry in general. Uh, it'll be something that uh, is going to come up and is going to be hopefully standardized at one point so that uh, everybody knows uh, that they are going to get paid and everybody knows that um, they're doing business with a party that will adhere to a contract. Okay. Okay. So Brian, I'll uh, throw in your direction here. How how important would you say is uh, technology, uh, and uh, what role does that play for you uh, when you're selecting a, a logistics service provider with regard to uh, be it now uh, connecting remotely, being able to uh, have people be able to work from home uh, to uh, to support your your requirements. Uh, what what's the role of technology when you when you uh, looking to when you're vetting a, a service provider? So you know today I would say it's not as much as I'd like it to be. I mean the reality is where when I look at the, the chartering the break bulk industry I, I still feel it's one of those spaces that hasn't been disrupted and there's a number of reasons behind that. You know uh, if I got 40 primary uh, carriers that we're working with for all these different businesses across the modes. I don't want to have to learn 40 different individual platforms. I don't want to have 40 different logins for it, right? So, you know, I think there's a space to be filled here and an opportunity where, you know, a third party neutral platform could come in and essentially be like the GT Nexus of what we do, right? Where we can go log into one place and have a dashboard that connects me with all our different carriers. And we go cradle to grave from, you know, vetting to RFQ to execution to big data analysis. So I think there's an opportunity there to do that. We've had some conversations and I've been, you know, reviewing some of the guys out there in this space, whether it's E2 Logistics, Shipamax, uh, you know, the Voyager platform. And we've been trying to see what's out there. The, the solution is not going to come from us. You know, G Digital is not going to develop the, 
you know, an internal platform. And I don't think it's going to come from the carrier forwarder side. You know, uh, if a carrier were to come to me and say, hey, we got this great platform, you can put all your carriers on it. I don't think BBC is going to want to go on and use, you know, the Thorco forwarder, you know, forwarding platform or whatever. It's, it's so, you know, I think there's a niche for it. And I wish it, I wish we were further along in that space than we are. Uh, but the reality today, it, you know, it's, it's it's still a lot of email. You know, sometimes I feel like we're email wranglers with all the position reports we get and all the, 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 the various updates that come by. But I think that's an area that I'm excited to see where it goes in the next three to five years because it's, it just hasn't been explored. And part of that is, you know, has the money been there on the carrier side? We're talking about an industry that has, you know, financially not been the best spot in the last 10 years. You know, and going back to the point, if you're a carrier and you invest a million dollars into a, a great platform, does that guarantee you the business? Well, if your ship's not in a position where I need it, I, I'm not going to hold my cargo for, for 30 days or 60 days for you to position the ship over there because I like using the platform. And so it's a difficult spot from there, right? And so I'd be curious to see where this, this goes. And that's, you know, I guess kind of in a nutshell where I, I see where technology is today, but where I see it could be in, in the role it could play in the future. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So Pascal, one of the one of the questions that came in uh, in advance of the webinar from uh, um, the uh, participants or the audience was um, a question on what weight uh, do uh, folks put on customer service uh, relationship and customer service uh, aspects versus cost and cost savings whenever they're evaluating a logistics service provider. Where does that wrap up in your world? Yeah, I think that's always a, it's, it, that's a fine line, right? Between trying to get your, your, your best rate in the market and, uh, and still making sure that you're getting the service quality uh, that, that you need for your product, right? So I think as, a, as an organization, we always be fairly conservative, um, holding uh, to the service providers that they're having. Obviously, we, we, we look for opportunities and look for uh, other, other service providers out there I think the approach that we've been been taking is uh, trying to work with our service providers uh, for in the long in the long run, right? And um, and I think what we what we've seen from doing that is is uh, being able to get uh, first of all, I, I believe a, 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 an attractive price, right? Uh, at least a competitive price. Um, but we see that that actually helps driving some cost savings on the back end, just because they understand our process. Um, they they know our uh, they know our products they know the folks that we're working with and so we're actually uh, within the overall process if you take look to the total landed cost I think uh, we, we get some benefits of working with with folks in the long run right um, and I think on the um, on the service on the service part that gives a little bit of flexibility on both sides right I think a carrier that knows you well and is working with you well is is I think uh, uh, is, is easier to I mean hold the vessel for a little bit longer, right? Get a late gate, um, get some equipment on that you really have a priority for, um, and so I think those kind of things I think uh, have been helping out. But uh, yeah, I think the savings itself or list a lower rate I think in some in some cases is is just a short term fix, um, and so I kind of prefer the longer the longer uh, standing relationships over that. Um, not saying that price price is obviously a very important part of that, right? But yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. So uh, Ken, that is going to prompt this question, um, you know, because there's always a discussion about uh, at the end of the day, what what what's really the deciding factor? Is it all about price, or is it uh, more about uh, who you're doing business with, and can you trust them? Um, in your experience, and and uh, an ocean carrier is obviously going to be vetted a little bit different than a uh, let's say a freight forwarder. Uh, you're being vetted uh, perhaps on a shipment by shipment basis as opposed to a forwarder that's being vetted for uh, you know an entire project and uh, many many shipments over the course of uh, perhaps several years. But in your experience, um, you know what percentage of shippers would you say concern themselves at all? about uh, vetting versus just being concerned with maybe say transit time and price and that you know to heck with all the other stuff that uh, maybe they should be doing to uh, to get a sense of who they're doing business with is it all about the price and about whatever you can offer in the way of transit times 
I say, uh, I wish I could put a percentage on Dennis. Uh, I, I don't have that uh, record, uh, but the volume business uh, being the wind industry, for example, uh, you know, they, they have started a, a vetting process that, uh, that of course, especially since some of the, um, some of the bankruptcies we've had of carriers or some of the consolidation has been on carriers, you know, there's been a needed, um, it's been a needed process to take to make sure that, uh, that your cargo will also arrive without being arrested on the way. Um, but it's in, in my point of view, the, the, um, you know, the, the cargo that we get in and that we handle on a, on a yearly basis, uh, of that being with uh, vetted uh, or people that has vetting in place, I would say probably not even 40%. Um, it's, it's one of those things that with, as Pascal also mentioned, with an industry that's been under pressure for so long, um, you know, you're making sure that, uh, that you show the company uh, in front of your clients that will get the job done. And, um, and then you work your way through it afterwards. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the standardization of something where a KYC or a, a vetting system on the carrier side is still very much non-existent. Um, there's definitely some, some tighter uh, rules and in, uh, in internal vetting, but nothing standardized. So, so it's very much so matter also for the shippers as we see it it's, it's very much do you have your uh, ship in position for this cargo um, do I know that uh, we have done business before and have I seen that you will take my cargo from A to B without stopping uh, three ports on the way you know in that case sure let's uh, let's go along with that rather than it is a whole vetting uh, procedure so like, back to Brian you know it's very much emails and the uh, what, what we agree to today uh, will also stand on the next year. Okay. So, um, Ken, I'm going to stick with you here, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to go over to uh, ask the same question of Leonard. What we haven't heard uh, thus far, I don't think, unless I missed it, but uh, we haven't heard about safety programs. And uh, so, what kind of information is out there, or that the TSL maintains? Uh, if a shipper were to come in and ask a question about your safety record and, and how important do you think that is, uh, which we, or maybe should be with regard to, uh, to vetting an ocean carrier. And then Len, I'll ask you the same question, or you can respond with regard to, uh, vetting a, uh, uh, a forwarder, uh, this, you know, it, it, do you maintain safety data? Is there any industry standard safety data? Uh, how, how does that play a part in the, uh, the vetting process in your experience? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, well, there, yes, safety and uh, keeping a record of safety uh, has become uh, more standardized over, uh, over the past, let's say, 10 years. And um, I believe now um, part of the standards are that you have a, a vessel safety checklist. You have toolbox meetings in front of every uh, shipment that you carry and vessel safety statistics are you know everyday life on board uh, the ships that, that uh, of the carriers that we do business with um, now it's still uh, somewhat uh, somewhat inconclusive to an extent where you have for example you have um, you're keeping a record of your last incident or how many days since your last incident but if you've only been working three ships since the last incident, you know, that may not tell a lot about your safety record. So the hard questions that, for example, Bexel uh, have been uh, good at asking and also other shippers have been good at asking certainly trickle down into the uh, carriers also where they need to keep a track of injury time and lost days of work, et cetera. So, so that's definitely taken the um, forefront here in the, in the past. Even five years, you know, it's, it's just going that direction where people want to know how well are you equipped to take care of uh, not only safety of your crew, but also environmental uh, incidents. So, uh, so the statistics of it and keeping track of it is uh, very much uh, in focus now. Okay, Len, you want to adjust that briefly? Sure, I, I think, and really in line with what Ken has said, is. Uh, 
you know, this is this is this is a common element uh, that we see on the you know vendor qualifications. Uh, you know, they want to know they want to know about your HSE program. Uh, they want to know, you know, uh, about incidents and accidents. You know, how are they recorded? Um, you know, I would say that at Bellore we have a very robust HSE program um, because not only do we have a logistics division, but we're also a port operator and we also are a rail operator. So we're working with a lot of equipment. Um, so uh, being in compliant with, uh, you know, our customers are being aligned with their programs is of the utmost importance. So it's, it's something, that, something that is definitely a part of our daily business, daily activities, and uh, a lot of awareness is, uh, and a lot of attention is, is, is paid to, you know, HSE. Okay, thanks. So there's a, there's a question that got posted uh, uh, that I'd like to address, and it's a, I think it's a question for actually for both the uh, shippers and for the uh, logistics service providers about using um, Security Exchange Commission um, as a uh, resource to check the financial uh, conditions or financial fitness of a company uh, both ways, either either of a, uh, a buyer or of the provider. So has anybody had any experience uh, with using uh, the FEC Security Exchange Commission in the U.S. as a resource, Pascal, have you uh, have you seen that, or or do you guys uh, make make use of uh, the SEC information? Yeah, I mean, we're um, on the on the vetting of our providers before they get on on our list. Um, we're actually using that. Um, we're, we're using a lot of outside resources um, on the vetting, and I think the SEC data is 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 one of them, right? Um, just from a compliance perspective, I think there's other, there's other sources there as well, as far as it goes to even local newspapers and, and articles that are being written, right? And so, um, I think all of those things are assessed, but, but we definitely use the, um, the, the SEC data, um, as well as some other public data if, if it's available, right? Um, and, and not always is that obviously available, um, but, um, what, what we can find, we'll try to find in, uh, you go into local carriers and some more remote um, remote areas. This gets a little bit more challenging, right? But uh, um, we use an, an external party um, to to get that kind of information. Um, I, I saw another question above that, and maybe this answers that as well. I think we we redo that um, every three to five years um, for for our main uh, contractors. So I think that is. Uh, it's not something that is just a one time. You get on the list, and and we'll never look at that again, right? So. Uh, we do that on a fairly fairly continuous basis. Okay, Brian, how about you? You know, when we first uh, onboard a carrier, we do use a lot of outsourced resources to 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 check that carrier, make sure they're not on a do not do business list, make sure that they're you know check their finances, uh, you know where they headquartered, uh, you know their tax IDs, all that's all that information. Once they are part of our 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 our, our, our group there. Um, you know, then what we typically do a lot of times is I'll read the annual reports if they happen to be published to see where their cash positions are. Um, you know, and, and then we kind of read the news and see what's going on within the organization, their industry from that standpoint. If we're going to an area where we're using a carrier we haven't used before, uh, we're using a niche carrier, we're going through a, a, a third party like a forwarder or a 3PL. Um, in that case, you know, in our eyes, that, that 3PL is responsible for that. Uh, their subcontractor. They're the prime on the contract. They're responsible for that subcontractor. So they sign for, you know, financial responsibility for that subcontractor as well as that subcontractor adhering to all GE, you know, EHS policies. And we basically hold that that, uh, that third party as the uh, as the carrier in our eyes. Leslie, how are we doing for time here? On um, we've got maybe another three minutes. Uh, so we'll have to wrap that up soon. I do see a question up here that I think is interesting. Um, how can, let's see, logistics provider providers improve today? What, you guys on the panel, what are some things that would um, be welcome at this time that you're not seeing maybe across the board? I guess that's for the shippers, right? I think so. Yeah. And Dennis, you chime in, Pascal, Brian. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. You I know, think, for me, um, 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, you know, one thing that makes me a little nervous when I look three or five years down the road is the uh, the lack of investment within the multi-purpose fleet. You look at the order book, you look at the aging out of the vessels. Um, you know, I, I kind of think maybe we're going to head for a supply and demand uh, uh, curve uh, adjustment at some point here. Uh, just as I see a lot of vessels not on order, a lot of vessels starting to age out. And, and part of that is there's the uh, the return on investment to invest in new ships today just isn't there. There's no capital in the industry. So that may, I wish I saw uh, more investment in, in, in the fleet overall, but I understand the constraints around that. But I think that could be an issue we face down the road. Pascal? Yeah, I think uh, some similar comments there on, on, uh, on, on vessels, right? Um, I think from the other perspective, I think uh, some of the technologies I think that are being used within the industry and trying to see if they can connect right uh, between each other. I think that's one of the challenges that we see um, just something as simple as tracking information all the way down from the, the vessel carrier to the port to the custom broker to the to the logistics service provider. Right. And, and I guess this is a popular comment with, within my organization, but like, Hey, uh, if Amazon can track all your, your shipments, uh, why can we not do the same thing? Right. And, and obviously our business is a little bit different than shipping small parcels to, to, to uh, home addresses. But, um, I mean, that, that, uh, transparency, um, of, uh, of where your cargo is and, and kind of where is it sitting? Um, just some investment in, in technology or kind of providing that technology is, is, is one thing, right? Now, I also I think very similar comment there, right? I don't think that that can come from just one carrier or it can come from one logistic service provider just because not everybody is going to be on board uh, with, with working in the platform of, of a competitor or semi-competitor, right? But uh, I think that's one of these challenges that, that, that I, I think uh, hopefully we're, we're going to solve over the next couple of years. So, you know, one of the questions that uh, uh, got posted here and, and one that was on my list, and I know we're, we're drawn near on time here, but I think an important one is uh, how a buyer of logistic services would assess their provider. And this, this also goes for forwarders or goes for, for carriers like yourself, Ken, who are subcontracting some of your work to uh, be at a stevedoring company or a port agent, whomever. How do you make sure that the uh, that the terms and conditions, the requirements of a bid are getting passed down to to subs? Uh, there's a contractual side of that, but then there's also just the um, the assurance that your requirements are going to get passed down uh, to uh, anybody that would be brought in as a subcontractor. Lynn, uh, can you address that? Leonard, still with us? Sorry, Dana, I'm sorry you were. I, I didn't hear the last part. Uh, the the question of uh, flowing uh, requirements down to your subcontractor. So, uh, uh, what buyer logistic services is trying to assess you as a service provider? One of the things that they uh, would be interested in would be: uh, Am I going to choose somebody that's good at understanding my requirements and then being able to flow them down any subcontractors that you might employ on behalf of serving me, the buyer. Sure. Sure. Dennis. Thank you. Uh, I think in, in, you know, so what, what we would do was the same flow that flow down and the same uh, terms and conditions that we have to abide by would be written into our contract with our subcontractors. And that way that ensures that, uh, you know, everyone is on the same page and that uh, not only are we fully aware of what the requirements, but so uh, so too is the subcontractor. Okay. Ken, you want to throw anything on that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, more to an extent of, you know, it becomes interesting when um, Sam, you were, Samuel, you were asking about the SEC being used, you know, using Dun & Bradstreet, for example, or Lloyd's Intelligence has a great program for uh, tracking the financial uh, strength of a, of a carrier or even an individual vessel. And I think it comes down to something that, um, you know, once you have your cargo on board at a specific vessel, it often comes down to how well is that specific ship financed. And again, you know, 
with the beating that the industry has taken, and the and the Brian mentioned the the lack of investment into the fleet. You know, those vessels are often uh, not financed um, to the best of abilities. So, you know, the vetting of a single ship can be can be a tough question, but uh, but it's certainly something that uh, a shipper should go into. And also, uh, on the other side, you know, we've had McDermott who just recently uh, came out of Chapter Eleven. You have some some partners that you may want to reevaluate along the way, and uh, certainly also for the individual ship that's going to carry your cargo. It's, it's important to know that that, that ship is is um, able to sustain some kind of financial pressure along the way. Good point. That's a. I think that's a, probably a whole other webinar of uh, questions with regard to being able to vet a uh, uh, an MPV uh, carrier, uh, being that in most cases um you have to look at the individual ship's ownership to really to get a, a true assessment of uh uh that uh, of performance performance that's sold and in a lot of cases uh the uh, operators or managers are are not in control or um certainly it's not their financials that are uh, perhaps could be called into question, but the uh, the ownership of the vessel. So that that's a whole nother webinar, I think, Leslie. And yeah, we are, I think, I think we so. We're about out of time. If you had a couple closing remarks, are you asking me? Or are you asking? Yes, Dennis, yes, you. <laughs> well, I, I think this, is, this has been a, uh, a a good session. I think we could go on. And I know I've only gotten through maybe about half the questions I've had, but uh, really appreciate the interest. I think we had a high level of interest to folks that uh, signed up, and uh, certainly appreciate the panelists. Uh, you guys have all been great, and uh, obviously you were well prepared for for the comments here. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, would invite uh, all of those that are tuned in to uh, to reach out to any of us uh, uh, on the subject. I think we all want to do well at uh, being successful together, and I think we can do that if, uh, if we're honest with each other uh, and we uh, we work in each other's mutual interest. So uh, that's what it's all about. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Leslie. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And I particularly want to thank our panelists, Ken, Leonard, Brian, Pascal, and you, Dennis. Fantastic job. Uh, you'll shortly receive a link to the replay. We'll also post it on the website. Our uh, magazine editor has been on today's session, so we'll be doing a follow-up story on this too. So lots of coverage and discussion around vetting and i do want to tell you we're taking a break for the month of august but we will come back and see you in september thanks so much thank you leslie bye-bye thank you thank you thank you